Gracious God, we ask that you open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand the message of your word for us this day. Amen. If you watch TV at all, you've probably seen this commercial that shows a family walking almost stumbling down the hotel corridor. The overvoice tells us that the youngest child has been sick on the plane the whole way, and the middle child left his shoes on the airplane. And then the teenage daughter, with her look of scorn, does not want to be there. They ha look like they have only one or two more steps in them before they collapse. Have you seen this commercial on TV? This scene works to get our attention because most of us have had a family vacation like that. Am I right? We've all had that vacation, whether to the lake or the mountains or even to Disneyland, where you thought it would be a wonderful family time, a chance to bond and draw closer together as a family. We wanted to create the perfect family memory, but instead, everything that can possibly go wrong does. And every member of the family is at their worst behavior, and your only hope is that you will get back home before everything implodes and you end up killing each other. In the commercial, the family is rescued because one of the parents was smart enough to book with a travel site. And when they open that door, their room is large and comfortable and fully equipped with drinks and everything they need. And the view is amazing. And we are told that all their pain and suffering is worth it. And now the family bonds together in a wonderful experience. The message is clear. If you book with this company, you will reach the promised land, your family will love you, and life will be good. So how many of you who have experienced a family vacation from hell have had it end so wonderfully? Anybody? But really, if you think about it, while those family vacations might be hell while we're in the midst of them, don't they usually make for the best stories? If we can get in touch with one of our own experiences of a terrible family vacation, it might help us understand the children of Israel a little bit better. God has sent Moses up to the, to the Israelites in Egypt and get them start, have gotten them started on their own family vacation. God's plan was that they would find time in the wilderness to bond and to get to know one another better before reaching their own promised land as God's people. To get an idea of what it was really like, picture your worst family vacation. Got it? Now add in your siblings, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and in-laws. Now add in all the people from work, all your neighbors, and all the people here from church. Okay, take a breath, we're just pretending. Now add in the desert conditions. The sun beats down on you. There's little shade except for what you can make for yourself. By midday, it can reach well over 100 degrees. You start to sweat profusely, but you hardly notice because it is so dry that any moisture evaporates almost instantly. Add to the heat the fact that you have to watch for scorpions and snakes and other biting creatures. And a simple walk can become an obstacle course. After a day of walking, even with plenty of water, your mouth is dry and you long for some cool, juicy fruit like oranges or watermelon. And when the wind picks up, any little piece of sand can turn into a knife and cut into your skin. And your eyes are constantly under attack from the glare of the sun, the dryness of the air, and those small particles of sand that are everywhere. Now there are those who live in the desert who call themselves desert rats and wouldn't live anywhere else. But if you go to the desert from a moisture climate like here in Ohio, you are likely to complain a lot. Yes, but it's a dry heat. It will quickly become an annoying refrain. 
Having been to the desert southwest of our own country, I can appreciate a bit of what the Israelites are going through. I only had to endure the desert for a few days at a time, and never without the amenities of water and lots of food and plenty of shelter. Even with all the amenities, I complained. So I can understand the complaints of the Israelites when their little adventure stretched on for years and decades. And boy, do they complain. Are we there yet? I don't like it here. Can't we go back to Egypt? At least there we had a roof over our heads and food other than manna and quail to eat. When are we going to get there? Why did you drag us out here? I could have stayed in Egypt with my friends. Yes, there was that slavery bit and the risk of losing all your firstborn sons, but other than that, it really wasn't that bad in Egypt. What happens next often makes us a bit uncomfortable. God gets fed up with all their moaning and complaining and sends poisonous snakes into their midst to bite people, and many die. On the surface, it makes God look pretty mean and spiteful, doesn't it? We might join with the Egyptians and the Canaanites and even the Israelites themselves in asking, what kind of a God would redeem a people only to lead them out into the desert to die? But if we picture God as the parent in charge of the worst family vacation ever, maybe we can empathize a bit with God. I can imagine frustrated parent God saying, you're tired of this family vacation? You want to cry and complain? Fine, I'll give you something to cry about. I'll just stop the car right now and you can walk home. Oops, I'm sorry, wrong vacation. I'll remind you of what Egypt held for you pain, suffering, death, and shallow gods who punish you on a whim. There, are you happy now? And after the children of Israel have a chance to suffer and pout a bit, they come to their sympathetic parent, which in this story is Moses, and ask his help in calming angry parent God. After cooling down a bit, God says, you're right. Let me show them what a loving parent God is like. Moses, go make a bronze serpent and lift it up so that everyone who looks at it will live. Let them understand my redemptive love for them. Now to understand this story in the way that the Israelite people would have understood it a couple of thousand years ago, we have to understand the metaphors that were common to them. The snake represented death and danger. It also represented fertility, life, and healing. What gives life can also bring death. It's a matter of which you choose. It becomes a larger metaphor for life. Do you choose the things that tear down and destroy? Do you choose always to complain and to see the negative in everything? Do you choose an old life of slavery and death? A life that does not trust in God, a life that has no place for God? Or do you choose to put your trust in God? The snakes that killed represent choosing a life of slavery and death. The bronze snake that's lifted up represents choosing a life that trusts in God's redemption. Trusting in God's redemption is really a new idea for the children of Israel. And perhaps we can forgive them for being a bit slow to figure it out. We translate the Hebrew word, verb, ge'al, as the action of redeeming. It was a very important verb for the Hebrews, and redemption played an important part in their culture. The go'el, or redeemer, was a person who redeemed, who bought back property when a fam family member fell into hard times, they were the avenger who brought back family honor when a member was killed or otherwise dishonored. They were the one who acted as protector, defender, avenger, or rescuer for the family members, especially in situations of threat, loss, poverty, and injustice. The Redeemer did all this at a great cost to themselves, either financially or to the point of self-sacrifice. The Redeemer was expected to lay everything on the line for their family. 
This much the Israelites understood about redemption and the role of the Redeemer. But the Exodus story is the first place in the Bible where it is God who takes on this role. The Egyptian gods were always placated and appeased in order to get them to help with good harvest or a personal need. You would never expect an Egyptian god to lay their life, their security on the line to be your Goel, your Redeemer. So part of the whole wilderness experience for the children of Israel was for them to learn what it meant for God to be their Redeemer. It was God who redeemed them from slavery in Egypt. It was God who would redeem them from death and give them life. Remember that I said that sometimes the worst family vacations make for the best stories? The Israelites of a couple of thousand years ago would see this story as a teaching story for them to learn that God indeed was their Goel, their Redeemer and would always be their redeemer in earthly as well as spiritual matters. God said, I am your redeemer. I am your God. You shall have no others. Flash forward now to our gospel reading. When Jesus compares himself to Moses lifting up a serpent in the wilderness, every Israelite hearing this would understand that he was now placing himself in the role as their Goel, their Redeemer. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. The phrase lifted up is a slang expression for crucifixion. It's like our reference to hanging as being strung up. Jesus is identifying his coming crucifixion as being like the bronze serpent in the wilderness. When he is lifted up on the cross, he will have all the poison-absorbing capacity of that bronze serpent, and infinitely more, to draw the sickness and the sin out of people and restore them to life. No effort on the part of human beings can expel the poison that besets them. Only a goel, a redeemer, can draw the venom out of them and give them health and redemption. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the Son of God. Later in John's Gospel, Jesus again makes a direct reference to the poison-absorbing significance of his crucifixion. He says, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to me. The drawing mentioned is not a reference to a personal attractiveness or admiration. It is a specific term which means drawing the poison out of people so that they might have life. One translation of this text says that Jesus will draw all things instead of all people. Perhaps this is a reference to the ability of Jesus to redeem not only humankind, but the cosmos itself. Verses 19 through 21 are interesting because John is telling us that God's judgment is self-imposed. And this is the judgment, that the light came into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that they may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. God, through Jesus, is giving us a choice to accept redemption or not. For some folks hearing this, it would have been the ultimate blasphemy. For others, the ultimate hope for life. Today we center in the theme of God's redeeming grace in the midst of suffering and brokenness. We must remember that Lent, like the entire biblical story, is really about God's great redeeming love and grace for the world that God has created. The story of the people of Israel's crazy family vacation, wandering around in the wilderness for an entire generation, is more than just an account of a long ago people. It is our own story, 
and our family's own story of this crazy and sometimes chaotic and most times wondrous journey through life. The journey of Lent is one which requires focus and concentration because there are a lot of things that seek to distract us from our goal. It is a journey which will take us to the cross and then to the glory of Easter, which is the ultimate gift of God and the ultimate glimpse of God's redeeming grace. How then do we respond to such love? That is a question we must all ask ourselves daily. Will we seek the darkness in life or will we live in the light of day, the light of God's love? This is not just a spiritual exercise, but a choice for life. Which will we choose? May all who encounter us see reflected in our lives the light and grace of God's redeeming love. Amen.